Section 7 of The American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 7 The Greyhound by Colonel Roger D. Williams. It is not my intention to trace the history of the greyhound from his origin, through his gradual improvement and development, up to the present state of perfection. Nor shall I repeat all the arguments that have been advanced by other writers as to the origin and the derivation of the name of this breed. Yet a few lines may not be amiss as to his early history. The exact date of the origin of the greyhound is unknown but representations upon Egyptian monuments, tombs and obelisks prove beyond peradventure his existence over three thousand years ago. According to Hollinshed, the breed was first introduced into Britain during the third century. Other authorities, probably not as reliable, claim as early as B.C. 25. Arian, writing in his Synegeticus about A.D. 150, describes coursing in many of its details. Thus it will be seen that this sport is of great antiquity, at least seventeen hundred years old. The early Egyptians had several breeds of dogs, but the greyhounds were evidently always their favorites. They looked upon them with great veneration, and the death of one of them was lamented as a misfortune. With them they were considered a valuable animal, and occupied a conspicuous place in their households and traditions. Herodotus has recorded that when a greyhound died, all the members of the family to whom he belonged shaved their heads, and the body of the dog was buried in consecrated ground. In olden times none but the nobility were allowed to own greyhounds, and the killing of one, under the then existing game laws, was punishable with death. The Gauls coursed with greyhounds, both the smooth and rough-coated varieties, for the pleasure and excitement of the chase. The oldest coursing club we have any record of was that founded by Lord Orford at Norfolk in 1776. At the present day there are a large number in England alone. The natives of Sahara, Northern Africa, have great love and admiration for the greyhound. No matter how useful other breeds may be in watching, hunting, and so forth, they are looked upon as comparatively worthless, troublesome, and deserving of the great amount of abuse usually heaped upon them. While the rich regard the greyhounds as fit companions for their pastimes, and to the poor they prove bread, or rather meat winners, therefore neither class begrudge them the best of care and attention. Herds of goats are often kept to feed the hounds, and instances are recorded of women themselves having nursed the whelps of a particularly promising litter. Sir Walter Scott was a great admirer of dogs, and was especially fond of the greyhound. His famous dog, Maida, was presented to him by the chief of Glengarry. It is said that this dog could eat from his master's table standing flat-footed. He was said to be the finest specimen of the breed in Scotland, not only on account of his symmetry of form, but also on account of his extraordinary size and strength. He had a cross of staghound in him. Scott's poem to Bonnie Heck, a celebrated greyhound, will live as long as the memory of Scott himself. Kings and noblemen of all ranks in all ages have loved and fostered the greyhound, and have honored him with a place in their homes and by their firesides. By his respect for decency, his cleanliness, and his dignified aspect, the greyhound sustains the exalted position he occupies, and the daintiness with which he handles coarse or unclean food proclaims him the aristocrat of all canines. He is full of self-love and vanity, rivaling the peacock in these qualities. He is much more affectionate than he generally gets credit for being, and there are few passions felt by man that he does not share. Nor is he devoid of imagination, as many suppose. I have often seen an old courser, in his dreams, work himself into almost a frenzy while pursuing an imaginary jackrabbit jump to his feet, and then appear to feel very silly when he has found that he was merely dreaming. There can be no doubt that the English, Scotch, Persian, Russian, Grecian, and Italian greyhound, 
the Irish and Siberian wolfhound, the Scotch deerhound, and the whippet are but varieties of the same breed. Stonehenge classifies and divides the English greyhounds into the Newmarket, Lancashire, Yorkshire, and Wiltshire. These, however, seem to amount to distinctions without differences. None of the Native American dogs, so far as known, in any way resemble the greyhound. The native wild dog of Australia is built on the same lines as the greyhound, but is nearly extinct, being now rarely, if ever, met with. In Africa, India, Ceylon, and other tropical countries, the ordinary breeds of hunting dogs, especially the pointer, the foxhound, and the bloodhound, deteriorate rapidly, both physically and mentally, losing strength and energy. But such climate seems to have but little, if any, effect on the greyhound. These dogs seem equally at home in high altitudes, being capable of great and continued exertions, even as high as the timber line. In shape and form, the modern greyhound is far superior to that of olden times, if we may judge by the portraits and engravings handed down to us. In elegance of form, the improvement has been very marked, especially in the beauty of the head and neck. The qualities desired in this, the most elegant, the handsomest of his race, are speed, courage, without which he is not worth kennel-room, strength, staunchness, and endurance. He must have an affectionate disposition, but must also have plenty of vital force, dash, and spirit. It is a general supposition that the greyhound is entirely devoid of the power of scent. This is a great mistake, as can be attested by anyone who has ever hunted them, generally in the West upon large game. Of course, scent is not as well developed in the greyhound as in other breeds, because the uses to which he is put do not require scent, and, under the law of evolution, it has deteriorated as a natural consequence. Unrivaled in speed and endurance, these qualities have been developed and bred for, while the olfactory organs have been neglected necessarily by restricting the work of the dog to sight-hunting. Size and external form are of the greatest importance. Yet the fact that they can and do run in various sizes and forms is nevertheless generally apparent. These cases, of course, are the exception, and in making selection of stud-dogs or brood-bitches, it should be remembered that those formed in the mold most like the greatest number of winners will be the speediest. For open coursing on rabbits, I prefer a dog of medium size, say fifty-five pounds, because being nimble in turning, he is enabled to work close to the game, and to rapidly run up a large score of points, when once placed, that a larger, more unwieldy, and longer coupled dog, that necessarily runs wide at the turns, cannot wipe out unless placed repeatedly. For general use on the western plains, the larger and stronger the dog, the better. For by his immense powers of endurance, hardihood, and strength, he brings the larger game to bay, and either holds, kills, or harasses it until the arrival of his master. My old snowflight, standing thirty inches at shoulder, weighing one hundred pounds, measuring sixty-five inches from tip to tip, the hero of many a hard-fought battle on the plains and in the Rockies, also winner of numerous coursing matches and first prizes on the bench, was the typical dog for this purpose. The smaller dogs would stand but little show against the sharp hoofs and pointed antlers of the mule-deer and buck antelope, to say nothing of the glistening ivories of the grey timber-wolf, who is a most formidable antagonist when run down to a death finish. For an enclosed coursing meeting, similar to those held by the National and Eastern Coursing Clubs, the smaller dogs have an undoubted advantage over either of the former. Misterton, winner of the Waterloo Cup in 1879, the greatest sire of modern times, having taken in over twenty thousand dollars in stud fees, trained and ran at sixty-three pounds. Princess Dagmar, who sold at public auction for eight thousand dollars, weighed fifty-eight pounds. Kumasi, twice winner of the Waterloo Cup, weighed but forty-two pounds when in working condition, while Honeywood raced in great form at sixty-four pounds. Mullingar, winner of more money than any other courser, is even larger than his sire, Misterton. Among the winners and runners-up at the meetings of the American Coursing Club, 
Sandy Jim, Master Rich, Lord Neversettle, and Trails are large. Belle P., Midnight, and White Sox are medium. And Bessie Lee, Maida, and White Lips are small. Description The head should be long and narrow, slightly widening at the back. Low between the eyes. However, not cut away or dished along the nose. Jaw lean and full muscled. The eye should be bright, quick, and full, denoting animation. The ears should be small and carried close. The teeth should be white, strong, and of sufficient length to take and retain a firm hold. Neck length and pliability are of the greatest importance and should never be overlooked. A short neck will not only impede action, but pace as well. It should be well muscled, but not enough so to affect its flexibility and suppleness. Chest and Loins The chest should be deep and hatchet-shaped, and yet not too wide for the shoulders to play smoothly upon. Some authorities, Stonehenge among them, claim great depth of chest of fault. This I have never found true. A chest must have capacity to hold the heart and lungs, and, as width undoubtedly interferes with the movement and actions of the forequarters, in depth only can the heart and lungs get free action. The back should be broad and square, well arched, with a roll of muscle standing clear above each side of the spine. Many prefer the flat, straight back so popular in England at one time, but for an all-around good dog, at both long and short distances, the arched back is far preferable. The length of back should be between shoulder and last rib, rather than between last rib and hip bone. If too much length to the latter, the power to make a quick turn or wrench will be seriously interfered with. The loins should not only be wide and strong, but deep, with a good measurement around. Herein lies the power to gather quickly and extend. The tail should be long and tapered, and nicely curved, though not ringed. Not too coarse, though it may be heavy at the butt. Forequarters. Elbow straight, neither turned in nor out. The distance from the elbow to the knee should not be less than double same from knee to ground. Oblique shoulder blades to allow the legs to be well thrust forward. Shoulder muscular, without being overdeveloped or loaded strong pastern joints, well stood upon. Feet compact, rather round than long. Perfectly straight knuckles, well up. Toes close, with long claws. Sole thick and tough and indurated by use. Hind quarters. The hind quarters are the chief agent in propulsion, and should be strong and wide across. The stifle should be well bent. Legs set straight, with no tendency to cow-hock. Mediumly well apart, and short from hock to ground, with plenty of strength below the hock. Muscles hard and firm, and unless they are large and powerful in haunches and thighs, both speed and endurance will be lacking. The hind feet should not be too round, nor toes too upright. Yet this is preferable to the long, flat foot that lacks elasticity and springiness. A moderately flat hind foot will be found to stand the strain better. Color and Coat Color I have never known to cut any figure. However, I have never seen a rich red brindle that did not prove a good stayer in a killing race of three to five miles. I believe it but a coincidence, however, that Bell P., Master Rich, Bessie Lee, Rich and Rare, and Trails, winners at American Coursing Club meetings, were all brindle. The mouse or blue color seems to be most in demand, though the red or fawn color is oftener met with. The texture of the coat is proof of good breeding. It should be neither coarse nor fine, should be short rather than long. Above all, avoid the woolly or fur coat, as it is a sure sign of a cross, and generally denotes a delicate constitution, besides being hard to keep clean and healthy. The following are the relative values of points in judgment for the bench. Head, 10. Chest, 15. Legs, 15. 
neck ten, loin fifteen, tail five, back ribs ten, feet fifteen, color and coat five, total one hundred. The improvement of the greyhound in this country within the past two or three years has been very marked, and nowhere is it better demonstrated than at the meetings of the American Coursing Club. I predict that within ten years the fabulous prizes realized in England will be duplicated here. R. F. Walsh of London, in a recent letter to the Philadelphia Times, however, gives some startling figures in connection with greyhounds. He states that over one million pounds is paid at long odds on the long odds chances of the Waterloo Cup. Thomas Walsh of Kinsale, Ireland, refused one thousand pounds for Wilful King when but a puppy. Mr. Gladstone was offered six thousand five hundred pounds for a promising puppy, and Mr. Cross, owner of Qui Bono, often paid as high as two thousand pounds for a good greyhound. Training The successful breeding and training of a kennel of greyhounds is a precarious matter, requiring, in unlimited quantities, capital and patience, coupled with firmness and judgment, and a large fund of love for the dog. Unfortunately, many men, though possessing many good qualities, do not number among them a due consideration for their canine friends. They are apt to think that anything is good enough for a dog, either in the way of food, shelter, or bedding. This is a serious error. Anything that is unfit for a human being is unfit for a good dog. Exercise is as necessary to a greyhound's health and spirits as sufficient food itself is to other breeds. Almost invariably, proper exercise is denied them. They should be constantly in the open air, or should have access to same, and should not be injured by the restraints of a kennel, or enervated by the heat of a close room or fire. In preparing a dog for a certain meeting or a special event, he should be specially taken in hand not less than four weeks in advance, and if he has not had sufficient active and regular work previously to keep his muscles hard and his flesh down, five weeks will be necessary. The first point to be ascertained is the general health of the dog, and he should be watched carefully and closely for a few days. To ensure his being free from worms, after a twenty-four-hour fast, he should be given a pill of thirty grains of areca nut, or four grains of santonine, followed two hours later with a dose of castor oil. See that he's entirely free of vermin, eczema, and sores of all kinds. Never trust an attendant to feed for you. See personally every mouthful the dog eats. It is the constant watchfulness of a dog's every movement, action, and mood that denotes the thorough trainer. The result to be obtained should come from proper feeding, quality and not quantity of food being the end to be considered. No rules as to the quantity of food can be given, as dogs vary too much in their demands. The too rapid increase or decrease of flesh should regulate this. I do not believe in the sloppy food and stirabouts containing oat and cornmeal so highly recommended by many, but prefer slightly cooked beef with table scraps containing, where possible, vegetables and bread. The bowels can be kept in proper condition by an occasional feed of Spratt's greyhound biscuits, and where these cannot be had, cornbread with cracklings baked hard and brown will be found a cheap and excellent substitute. If very constipated, boiled liver should be given, in preference to harsh medicines. If the dog will eat it raw, its laxative powers will be found more beneficial in this state. The digestive canal of a dog is especially sensitive to the action of medicines, and they should only be used as a last resort. A couple of raw eggs once or twice a week can be given, especially should the coat feel rough, and be lacking in gloss. During the first few days of training the dog should be taught obedience, and this I have always found promptly and willingly rendered. He should be taught to come to heel and remain, and to range forward when ordered. It is absolutely necessary that he be taught to fence fearlessly, and to jump in and out of vehicles at command. Strict attention to this will save much trouble and worry later on. Never punish a greyhound unnecessarily, and never at all unless he understands thoroughly what it is for. 
when once thoroughly under command, he will remain so, rarely requiring punishment. In this respect being unlike other dogs that are credited with more sense. The first day, the trainer, mounted on horseback or in a vehicle, should, after feeding a biscuit, have the dog, if two they should be coupled with swivel couples, follow him a distance of five miles, taking a moderate gait, avoiding turnpikes and macadamized roads where possible. Upon return to the kennels, the feet and legs should be thoroughly washed and dried and minutely inspected. Then well bathed in Listerine. Some use tannic acid and glycerin. The objection to this is that it hardens the pad of the foot, which thereby loses its toughness and causes it to crack. The entire body should then be well rubbed and frictioned by the hand, never against the grain. The muscles of the thighs, shoulders, forelegs and loins should be well kneaded and manipulated for not less than thirty minutes each day. On the second day the run may be increased to ten miles, followed promptly by the same treatment upon return to the kennel. From this on the distance can be increased a mile daily until at the commencement of the third week he can do twenty miles a day with no signs of being sore-footed or stiff. This work should get his muscles and wind in proper condition, and remove all superfluous flesh inside and outside. At this stage speed, to a certain extent, must be sacrificed to lasting qualities and stamina, and training should be conducted so as to develop the general muscular powers, especially in the heart and lungs. Care should be taken, however, not to force beyond his capacity or to overwork a young dog, as the aim will be attained at a sacrifice of durability, with diminished strength of constitution. During the last week the distance can be cut down gradually to a couple of miles daily, until the day before the event a simple gallop across the turf should find him in a high state of efficiency as to wind and power to sustain fatigue. During this training, if the dog has never before been slipped upon jackrabbits, he should have from two to three courses a week on these, being slipped with a single good worker, willing and capable of doing his share. If you want a true and honest worker, do not work him on too many jacks, and never in a crowd of dogs, as he will soon learn to run cunning, thereby ruining his chance as a stake winner. For the habit once acquired is seldom overcome. Never blanket your dog during training, if it can be avoided. But have blankets at hand in case of cold or wet weather during the meeting. Working a dog under blankets to reduce flesh is more injurious than beneficial. The better plan is to increase his work and change the quality, not the quantity, of his food. The day of the running the dog should be kept muzzled. Two or three hours before going to the slips, feed one quarter pound of raw meat chopped fine with an egg broken over it. Feed nothing more till night. See that the dog has an opportunity to relieve his bowels. While in the slips stay close to him and watch carefully for any signs of his having picked up a sandbur, prickly pear or cactus, and in case he does so it should be promptly removed. If he shows any indication of a desire to relieve himself see that the slipper indulges him. This is important. Encourage him with your presence and do all you legitimately can to see that he is sighted promptly. Spare no pains or expense in getting a good mount and keep as close as possible to him during the course. After the kill take him up at once, sponge out his mouth, give him a few swallows of water from a bottle and rub gently yet firmly until natural breathing returns. If very much exhausted a little cold coffee may be given him from a bottle. Blanket close and keep moving briskly out of draught. After a course, wash and examine the stoppers, dew claws, nails, and feet thoroughly. When a nail or claw is partly detached, trim it neatly with sharp scissors, bathe thoroughly in Listerine, and before going to the slips for another course, rub with caustic, which will deaden the pain. Should the stoppers be injured, make a light cap or patch with soft kid, and apply with warm shoemaker's wax. This is far preferable to the boot, as not interfering with the movement and action of the legs. 
Should the dog go lame in the forearms, through a wrench, twist, or overexertion, do not let anyone persuade you to fire him. While it undoubtedly stiffens and strengthens the muscles temporarily, the custom is a barbarous one, seldom effective, and the after-results disastrous. Try the effect of complete rest, rubbing and bathing freely in Pond's extract. Never, under any circumstances, dispute the decision of a judge. It is time wasted. If you are satisfied you are not getting justice, draw your dog. If the dog is to be trained for track or flat racing, the same treatment should be given, with the following exceptions. Limit the maximum distances to fifteen miles a day, and at the commencement of the second week take a pair of well-mated dogs to a level stretch of country, or better still, a race or trotting track. Place them at the head of the quarter or home stretch in independent slips, handled by an attendant with whom they are not familiar. Engage and retain their attention as you walk off, say a furlong. Flourish a red flag, call them sharply, and as soon as both are well sighted, have the attendant slip them. When they reach you, show your appreciation of their smartness. Encourage them, pet and fondle them, give each a small bit of biscuit. This should be repeated several times, night and morning, taking care to stop as soon as they show the first signs of flagging interest. The distance can be gradually increased daily as desired. Should one of the pair show a disposition to bite, play with, or jostle his mate, slip the faster dog a second or two sooner. Should the faster dog be the offender, a spiked collar on the other will soon teach him better manners. You will be astonished to find how rapidly they learn, and what genuine interest they take in this sport. In preparing for the bench, the foregoing instructions for training should be followed as nearly as possible. But as there are many who probably have not such facilities, to them I say, give all the exercise you possibly can, teach your dog to retrieve a swiftly thrown ball, have him follow you as much as possible and train him to jump a cane, stick or umbrella, and indulge him in it to the fullest extent, for he will soon become fond of it. Rub, knead, and roll all his muscles a half hour at a time, and not less than three times a day. Brush briskly with a stiff hairbrush, and finish off with a soft chamois skin. Clean his teeth thoroughly, removing all discolorations. Give several good dressings to his coat with oil of tar and sulphur, followed by bath in tepid water, using the yelks of eggs instead of soap. Keep blanketed when not exercising. Feed as many eggs as his stomach will stand without becoming bilious, and let him lap a pint of milk daily. Teach him to lead kindly with the chain, and to stand perfectly still, with head and neck extended, feet and legs straight and well under him. Do not feed for twenty-four hours previous to judging. A few minutes before taking into the judge's ring, however, give a small piece of raw beef say, the size of two fingers. While in the ring, do not crowd your dog up close to the judge, but get as far away as the ring will permit. If he is a good one, the judge will never overlook him. If the sawdust in the ring is deep, clear a space that his feet and toes may be seen. If you do not succeed in getting his muscles hard and firm, stomach off and body devoid of surplus flesh, forfeit your entrance money and keep him at home. When showing on the bench, ascertain the location of the nearest vacant lot or park to the exhibition building, and give him a good long romp of not less than an hour daily. If unaccustomed to the patent biscuits usually fed at bench shows, feed on lean beef or mutton. If these instructions are carried out faithfully, the condition of your dog will remain good for several weeks. Otherwise, the close of the first show on the circuit will find him a physical wreck. When at home, between dates of shows, keep up his work, even if it be only for a few days. CARE AND WASHING Greyhounds are naturally cleanly, and require but little washing. When necessary, never before, make a solution of one part carbolic sheep tip to fifteen parts lukewarm water. Never use hot water on a dog under any circumstances. 
soak thoroughly, rubbing well in with the hand, being careful of the eyes. Follow this immediately with a mild soap. Bathe and finish up by lathering freely with the yolks of several eggs. Drench with cold water and rub thoroughly dry. No dog subjected to this treatment regularly will ever be troubled with vermin, eczema, or mange in any of its forms. If persisted in, it will cure the worst case of chronic mange that can be found. As before stated, the digestive canal of the dog is particularly irritable and very sensitive to the action of medicines. Therefore give as little medicine as possible. When medicine must be given, it should be administered with caution in homeopathic doses. Rather give him access to a woodland or garden once or twice a day, and he will find nature's remedies for his ailments. Food The greyhound is seldom a glutton and naturally requires but little food except when in training. Once in twenty-four hours is as often as he should be fed and a fast of forty-eight hours causes no inconvenience. Avoid grease and fatty substances. While boiled cornmeal is a most excellent food for the average dog, especially the foxhound, it should be rarely if ever given to a greyhound. It is very heating in its nature. Greyhounds are especially susceptible to skin diseases, and if they do not get an abundance of exercise while fed upon mush, will break out in troublesome sores and eczema. For a steady diet, table scraps containing bone, with an occasional meal of vegetables, will keep them in excellent condition. Never give them any food until it is perfectly cold, and where possible, have a regular hour for feeding, late in the afternoon being the best time. The kennel should be dry and well ventilated, with an elevated sleeping bench, with circulation of air under it. No bedding at all in summer, and hemp herds in winter. These remain free of vermin and moisture, and preserve the gloss of a dog's coat. I have here advocated the simpler, cheaper, and more practical methods of training, showing, and rearing greyhounds. I am fully aware that many of the swell owners, who dress their imported greyhound pets in costly blankets, feed them high-priced patent foods, wash them with scented soaps, and have a valet walk them through the parks, will turn up their noses at these instructions. But whenever their pets meet dogs that have been treated as I have directed, either on the bench or in the field, the difference will be as glaringly apparent to their owners as to others. Breeding and Rearing In the breeding of bitches and rearing of whelps, the same rules apply to greyhounds as to other breeds. I have often had greyhound bitches, especially the younger ones, refuse to allow the dog to serve them, although fully in heat. It is common to use force upon such occasions. This should never be allowed. But repeated trials should be made. Nature will regulate the matter finally. While in whelp, the bitch should have plenty of exercise, and, until too heavy, an occasional hunt. She should not be allowed to get too heavy in flesh nor yet kept too thin. A medium between the two should be maintained. Remove the dew claws on puppies when one week old, pulling them off with pincers. It will be unattended with pain. Allow the puppies to remain with the bitch as long as her condition warrants it. Should you desire to train or show the bitch after whelping, provide a foster mother for the puppies, and gradually relieve her until all are transferred. After weaning, the puppy should be fed three or four times a day, not less, and should be given bones to gnaw. If there not be plenty of limestone in the water used, a little phosphate of lime sprinkled on their food once a day will strengthen and enlarge their bones, thereby preventing standing over or springing of the knees, so common in young greyhounds. The enclosed coursing meetings, recently introduced into this country, and rapidly becoming popular, will do much to increase the popularity of the greyhound, and awaken interest in coursing in the middle and eastern states. At the same time they will have a tendency to destroy some of the best and strongest qualities of this breed, such as stamina and staying qualities. I predict that it will be but a short time, comparatively, until a weak, light specimen of the whippet order, capable of a fast, short spurt, will be much sought after, 
while the great game animal, with the heart and courage of a lion, capable of keeping up his speed to the end of a bruising four or five mile course, will be confined to the open meetings of the far west. Great credit is due the following gentlemen, among others for their untiring efforts in advancing the greyhound interests in America. Mr. H. W. Huntington, New York. Dr. Q. Van Hummel, Kansas City. Montgomery Pfister, Cincinnati. Dr. N. Rowe, Chicago. Dr. G. Irwin Royce, D. N. Heiser, M. E. Allison, H. C. Lowe, Kansas. A. C. Lighthall, Denver, and C. G. Page, Nebraska. Among other prominent breeders or owners of greyhounds may be mentioned in the Devon Kennels, 82 Front Street, New York City. Alpine Kennels, 38th Street and 1st Avenue, New York City. J. Herbert Watson, 79 Downing Street, Brooklyn, New York. John E. Thayer, Lancaster, Massachusetts. J. Van Shake, 32 Broad Street, New York City. Woodhaven Kennels, Woodhaven, Long Island, New York. Mrs. Sarah Leggett Emery, 253 Fifth Avenue, New York City. F. G. Stewart, Box 83, Hoosick Falls, New York. W. E. Stevens, Riverside, Illinois. Frank Welch, Box 172, Lamont, Illinois. A. M. Young, 93 Park Street, Albany, Indiana. Ed G. Howell, Denver, Colorado. D. H. Stein, Newport, Kentucky, and Middleton Kennels, Cassopolis, Michigan. Among the many good dogs which Mr. Huntington has imported or bred may be mentioned Champion Balkus, a large, upstanding, well-built dog, and a famous bench show winner, both in this country and in England. His winnings in America are First and Special, Hartford, 1887 First and Special, Boston, 1887 First and Special, Troy, 1888 Champion and Special, New York, 1888. Champion New Haven, 1888. Champion Boston, 1888. Champion and Special, Buffalo, 1888. Champion and Special, Syracuse, 1888. Champion New Bedford, 1889. Champion and Special, New York, 1889. Challenge, Troy, 1889. Challenge Albany, 1889. Challenge Utica, 1889. Challenge Worcester, 1889. Special Challenge, Boston, 1889. Challenge Toronto, 1889. First Danbury, 1889. One Special, Danbury, and two Specials, Toronto, 1889. Challenge New York, 1890. Challenge Boston, 1890. Challenge Buffalo, 1890. Mr. Huntington's Highland Chief is a handsome white and black dog, and though only three years old, has the following winnings to his credit. First Special and Second Special, Syracuse, 1888. First Richmond, 1888. First and Special, New Bedford, 1889. Special, New York, 1889. First Troy, 1889. First Albany, 1889. First and Special Utica, 1889. First Special Chicago, 1890. Special Challenge New York, 1890. Third and Special Buffalo, 1888. Third New York, 1889. Among Mr. Allison's best dogs are Champion Sandy Jim, 5337, who won first at Great Bend in 1886 and first in all age stakes at same meeting. Reno Bell, 5342, runner-up in championship stake at same meeting, is the mother of Sandy Jim. Terry, little brother of Sandy Jim, was runner-up in the all-age stake at the same meeting. Mr. H. C. Lowe's White Lips is a remarkably clever bitch. She has seldom been exhibited at bench shows in this country, but has done some good work at coursing meets and has an excellent record for field work on antelopes, wolves, and jackrabbits. I consider her one of the quickest and closest workers on jackrabbits I have ever seen, and nothing but force of circumstances held her down to the position of runner-up in the American Cup race in both 1888 and 1889. A general impression prevails that the greyhound is a timid animal, 
lacking heart and courage. This may be true of some strains of the breed. But could the reader have ridden several courses with me at meetings of the American Coursing Club which I have judged, and have seen greyhounds, as I have seen them, run until their hind legs refuse to propel them farther, and then crawl on their breasts after a thoroughly used-up jackrabbit but a few feet in advance, the singing and whistling in their throats audible at fifty yards, literally in the last gasp of death trying to reach their prey, he or she would agree with me in crediting them with both the qualities mentioned. In hunting the antelope, it is not an uncommon thing to see a greyhound, especially in hot weather, continue the chase until he drops and dies before his master reaches him. An uninjured antelope is capable of giving any greyhound all the work he can stand, and unless the latter is in prime condition, his chances are poor indeed to throttle. A peculiar feature of the greyhound is that he always attacks large game in the throat, head, or forepart of the body. I have even seen them leave the line of the jackrabbit to get at his throat. Old California Joe, at one time chief of scouts with General Custer, in 1875 owned a grand specimen of the greyhound called Kentuck, presented to him by General Custer. I saw this dog seize and throw a yearling bull buffalo, and the former was then dragged on his back over rough stones, trampled and pawed until his ears were split, two ribs broken, and neck and foreshoulders frightfully cut and lacerated. Yet he never released his hold until a sharp's rifle bullet through the heart of the buffalo ended the unequal struggle. Talk about a lack of courage! What mastiff, bulldog, or Great Dane could excel in courage old Kentuck? I have seen many a greyhound, single-handed and alone, overhaul and tackle a coyote, and in a pack have seen them close in and take hold of a timber wolf or mountain lion, and stay through the fight, coming out bleeding and quivering, with hardly a whole skin among them. Sir Samuel Baker, in his explorations in Africa and his jungle hunting in Ceylon, was always accompanied by a pack of greyhounds, and the deeds of valor performed by them on wild game, as recounted by him, proved their courage beyond doubt. In point of speed, courage, fortitude, endurance, sagacity, and fine, almost human judgment, no grander animal lives than the greyhound. He knows no fear, he turns from no game animal on which he is sighted, no matter how large or how ferocious. He pursues with the speed of the wind, seizes the instant he comes up with the game, and stays in the fight until either he or the quarry is dead. The following revised rules have been adopted as the standard for American coursing, and any one training greyhound should be perfectly familiar with them in all their details. 1. The judge shall be appointed the night the drawing takes place. The slipper and other field officials shall also be appointed on the night of the draw. 2. Two weeks' notice shall be given of the day of the drawing, through the public press. 3. The drawing shall take place at least three days previous to the running, when the time and place of putting the first brace of dogs into the slip shall be declared. A card or counter, bearing a corresponding number, shall be assigned to each entry. These numbered cards or counters shall then be placed together and drawn indiscriminately. This classification, once made, shall not be disturbed throughout the meeting, except for the purpose of guarding or on account of buys. Dogs whose position on the cards has been altered in consequence of guarding or of buys must return to their original position in the next round, if guarding does not prevent it. 4. Guarding when more than one nomination in a stake is taken in one name, the greyhounds, if bona fide the property of the same owner, shall be guarded throughout. This is always to be arranged, as far as possible, by bringing up the dogs from below to meet those which are to be guarded. This guarding is not, however, to deprive any dog of a natural buy to which he may be entitled, either in the draw or in running through the stake. 5. Buys. A natural buy shall be given to the lowest available dog in each round. No dog shall run a second such buy in any stake, unless it is unavoidable. 
When a dog is entitled to a buy, either natural or accidental, his owner or nominator may run any greyhound he pleases, to assist in the course. Provided, always, that in sapling stakes only a sapling may be used, and in puppy stakes none older than a puppy. But if it be proven to the satisfaction of the stewards that no puppy can be found to run an accidental buy, the owner shall have the power of substituting an old dog. No dog shall run any by earlier than his position on the card entitles him to do so. The judge shall decide whether enough has been done to constitute a course, or whether it must be run again. If at the commencement of any round in a stake one dog in each course has a by, those by shall not be run, but the dog shall take their places for the next round as if the bys had been run. 6. Postponement of a Meeting a meeting appointed to take place on a certain day may, if a majority of the committee, and the stewards if appointed, consider the weather unfavorable for coursing be postponed from day to day. But if the running does not commence within the current week, all nominations shall be void, and the expenses shall be paid by the subscribers in proportion to the number of nominations taken by each. In the case of produce stakes, however, the original entry shall continue binding if the meeting is held at a later period of the season. 7. Taking Dogs to the Slips Every dog must be brought to the slips in proper turn, without delay, under a penalty of five dollars. If absent for more than ten minutes, according to the report of any one of the stewards, its opponent shall be entitled to claim the course, and shall in that case run a by. If both dogs be absent at the expiration of ten minutes, the steward shall have power to disqualify both dogs, or to fine their owners any sum not exceeding twenty-five dollars each. No dog shall be put into the slips for a deciding course until thirty minutes after the decision of the course in the previous round, without the consent of its owners. 8. Control of Dogs in Slips The control of all matters connected with slipping the greyhounds shall rest with the stewards of a meeting. Owners or servants, after delivering their dogs into the hands of the slipper, may follow close after them, but not so close as to inconvenience the slipper or in any way interfere with the dogs. Nor must they halloo them on while running, under a penalty of five dollars. Any greyhound found to be beyond control may be loosed out of the slips, and the course decided by the rules of the club. 9. Greyhounds of same color to wear collars. When two greyhounds, drawn together, are of the same color, they shall each wear a collar, and the owner shall be subject to a penalty of one dollar for non-observance of this rule. The collar to be red for the left-hand side, and white for the right-hand side of the slips. After the first round, the upper dog on the card for the day will be placed on the left hand, and the lower dog on the right of the slips. 10. The order to slip may be given by the judge or by a slip steward, or the stewards of a meeting may leave the slip to the sole discretion of the slipper. The length of slip must necessarily vary with the nature of the ground, but should never be less than eighty yards, and must be maintained of one uniform length as far as possible through each stake. 11. The Slipper If one greyhound gets out of the slips, the slipper shall not let the other go. In the case of slips breaking, and either or both dogs getting away in consequence, the slipper may call both dogs back and put them again in the slips, at the discretion of the stewards. 12. The judge shall be subject to the general rules which may be established by the American Coursing Club for his guidance. He shall, on the termination of each course, immediately deliver his decision aloud, and shall not recall or reverse his decision, on any pretext whatever, after it has been declared. But no decision shall be delivered until the judge is perfectly satisfied that the course is absolutely terminated. 13. The judge shall decide all courses upon the one uniform principle that the greyhound which does the most toward killing the hare, during the continuance of the course, is to be declared the winner. The principle is to be carried out by estimating the value of the work done by each greyhound, as seen by him, upon a balance of points, according to the scale hereafter laid down, from which also are to be deducted certain specified allowances and penalties, all races to be run by courses. 
14. The points of the courses are a. Speed, which shall be estimated as one, two, or three points according to the degree of superiority shown. See definition A below. b. The go-by, two points, or if gained on the outer circle, three points. c. The turn, one point. d. The wrench, half a point. e. The kill, two points or in a descending scale in proportion to the degree of merit displayed in that kill, which may be of no value. F. The trip, one point. Definition of points A. In estimating the value of speed to the hair, the judge must take into account the several forms in which it may be displayed. Namely, 1. Where in the run-up a clear lead is gained by one of the dogs in which case one, two, or three points may be given, according to the length of the lead, apart from the score for a turn or wrench. In awarding these points, the judge shall take into consideration the merit of a lead obtained by a dog which has lost ground at the start, either from being unsighted or from a bad slip, or which has had to run the outer circle. 2. When one greyhound leads the other so long as the hare runs straight, but loses the lead from her bending round decidedly in favor of the slower dog of her own accord, in which case the one greyhound shall score one point for speed shown, and the other dog shall score one for first turn. 3. Under no circumstances is speed without subsequent work to be allowed to decide a course, except where great superiority is shown by one greyhound over another in a long lead to covert. If a dog, after gaining the first six points, still keeps possession of the hare by superior speed, he shall have double the prescribed allowance for the subsequent points made before his opponent begins to score. b. The go-by is where one greyhound starts a clear length behind his opponent and yet passes him in a straight run, and gets a clear length before him. c. The turn is where the hare is brought round at not less than a right angle from her previous line. d. The wrench is where the hare is bent from her line at less than a right angle, but where she only leaves her line to suit herself and not from the greyhound pressing her. Nothing is to be allowed. e. The merit of a kill must be estimated according to whether a greyhound, by his own superior dash and skill, bears the hare whether he picks her up through any little accidental circumstances favoring him, or whether she is turned into his mouth, as it were, by the other greyhound. f. The trip, or an unsuccessful effort to kill, is where the hare is thrown off her legs, or where a greyhound catches her but cannot hold her. 15. The following allowances shall be made for accidents to a greyhound during a course but in every case they shall only be deducted from the other dog's score. a. For losing ground at the start, either from being unsighted or from a bad slip, the judge is to decide what amount of allowance is to be made, on the principle that the score of the foremost dog is not to begin until the second has had an opportunity of joining in the course. b where a hare bears very decidedly in disfavor of one of the dogs after the first or subsequent turns, the next point shall not be scored by the dog which may be unduly favored, or only half his point allowed according to circumstances. No greyhound shall receive any allowances for a fall, or any accident of any description whatever, with the exception of being ridden over by the owner of the competing greyhound or his servant, provided for by Rule 25 or when pressing the hare, in which case his opponent shall not count the next point made. 16. Penalties are as follows. a. Where a greyhound, from his own defect, refuses to follow the hare at which he has slipped, he shall lose the course. b. Where a greyhound willfully stands still in a course, or departs from directly pursuing the hare, no point subsequently made by him shall be scored and if the points made by him up to that time be just equal to those made by his antagonist in the whole course, he shall thereby lose the course. 
but where one or both dogs stop with the hare in view, through inability to continue the course, it shall be decided according to the number of points gained by each dog during the whole course. C. If a dog refuses to fence where the other fences, any points subsequently made by him are not scored. But if he does his best to fence, and is foiled by sticking in a hedge, the course shall end there. When the points are equal, the superior fencer shall win the course. 17. If a second hare be started during the course, and one of the dogs follows her, the course shall end there. 18. A no course is when by accident or by the shortness of the course the dogs are not tried together, and if one be then drawn the other must run a by, unless the judge, on being appealed to, shall decide that he has done work enough to be exempted from it. An undecided course is where the judge considers the merits of the dogs equal. And if either is then drawn, the other cannot be required to run a by, but the owners must at the time declare which dog remains in. See Rule 21. The judge shall signify the distinction between a no course and an undecided by taking off his hat in the latter case only. After an undecided or no course, if the dogs, before being taken up, get on another or the same hare, the judge must follow and shall decide in favor of one, if he considers that there has been a sufficient trial to justify his doing so. A no course or undecided may be run again immediately, or if claimed on behalf of both dogs, before the next brace are put into the slips, or in the case of no course, if so ordered by the judge. Otherwise it shall be run again after the two next courses, unless it stand over to the next morning, when it shall be the first course run. If it is the last course of the day, fifteen minutes shall be allowed after both dogs are taken up. 19. Impugning Judge. If any person openly impugns the decision of the judge on the ground, he shall forfeit not more than twenty-five dollars nor less than ten dollars. 20. Objections. An objection to a greyhound may be made to any one of the stewards of a meeting at any time before the stakes are paid over, upon the objector lodging in the hand of such steward or the secretary the sum of twenty-five dollars, which shall be forfeited if the objection proves frivolous, or if he shall not bring the case before the next meeting of the club, or give notice to the stewards previous hitherto of his intention to withdraw his objection. The owner of the greyhound objected to must also deposit twenty-five dollars, and prove the correctness of his entry. All expenses in consequence of the objection shall be borne by the party against whom the decision may be given. Should an objection be made which cannot at the time be substantiated or disproved, the greyhound may be allowed to run under protest, the stewards retaining his winnings until the objection has been withdrawn or heard and decided. If the greyhound objected to be disqualified, the amount to which he would otherwise have been entitled shall be divided equally among the dogs beaten by him. And if a piece of plate or prize has been added and won by him, only the dogs which he beat in the several rounds shall have a right to contend for it. 21. Withdrawal of a dog. If a dog be withdrawn from any stake on the field, its owner, or someone having his authority, must at once give notice to the secretary or flag steward. If the dog belongs to either of these officials, the notice must be given to the other. 22. Stakes not run out. When two greyhounds remain in for the deciding course, the stakes shall be considered divided if they belong to the same owner, or to confederates, and also if the owner of one of the two dogs induces the owner of the other to draw him for any payment or consideration. But if one of the two be drawn without payment or consideration, from lameness, or from any cause clearly affecting his chance of winning, the other may be declared the winner, the facts of the case being clearly proved to the satisfaction of the stewards. The same rule shall apply when more than two dogs remain in at the end of a stake which is not run out. And in the case of a division between three or more dogs, of which two or more belong to the same owner, these latter shall be held to take equal shares of the total amount received by their owners in the division. The terms of any arrangements to divide the winnings, and the amounts of any money given to induce the owner of a dog to draw him, must be declared by the secretary. 
23. Winners of stakes running together. If two greyhounds shall each win a stake, and have to run together for a final prize or challenge cup, should they not have run an equal number of ties in their respective stakes, the greyhound which has run the smaller number of courses must run a bye or byes to put itself upon an equality in this respect with its opponent. 24. Greyhound Getting Loose Any person allowing a greyhound to get loose and to join in a course which is being run shall be fined five dollars. If the loose greyhound belong to either of the owners of the dogs engaged in the particular course, such owner shall forfeit his chance of the stake with the dog then running, unless he can prove to the satisfaction of the stewards that he had not been able to get the loose greyhound taken up after running its own course. The course is not to be considered as necessarily ended when a third dog joins in. 25. Riding over a greyhound. If any subscriber, or his servant, shall ride over his opponent's greyhound while running in a course, the owners of the dog so ridden over shall, although the course be given against him, be deemed the winner of it, or shall have the option of allowing the other dog to remain and to run out the stake, and in such case shall be entitled to half the winnings if any. 26. Description of Entry Every subscriber to a stake must name his dog at or before the entry, giving the names, the running names if they had any, of the sire and dam of the dog entered if possible, with the color of the dog entered. For puppy stakes, the names, pedigrees, ages, and colors shall be detailed in writing to the secretary of a meeting at the time of entry. No greyhound is to be considered a puppy which has whelped before the first of January of the same year preceding the commencement of the season of running. A sapling is a greyhound whelped on or after the first of January of the same year in which the season of running commenced, and any greyhound whose marks and pedigree shall be proved not to correspond with the entry given shall be disqualified, and the whole of its stakes or winnings forfeited. 27. Breeding Puppies Every member of the club breeding puppies shall notify the secretary in writing within ten days after the birth of any puppies, of the number of dogs and bitches, colors and other distinguishing marks, date of birth and the name of sire and dam. Any member violating this rule will not be allowed to enter or run any of such puppies in a puppy or sapling stake. 28. Alteration of Name if any subscriber should enter a greyhound by a different name from that in which it shall have last run in public, he shall give notice of the alteration to the secretary at the time of entry, and the secretary shall place on the card both the late and present name of the dog. If notice of the alteration be not given, the dog shall be disqualified. 29. Prefix of ends. Any subscriber taking an entry in a stake and not prefixing the word names ends to a greyhound which is not his own property shall forfeit that greyhound's chance of the stake. He shall likewise, if requested, deliver in writing to the secretary of the meeting the name of the bona fide owner of the greyhound named by him. And this communication is to be produced should any dispute arise in the matter. 30. Payment of Stakes all monies due for nominations taken must be paid at or before the entry, whether the stakes fill or not, and although from insufficient description or any other cause the dogs named may be disqualified. No entry shall be valid unless the amount due for it has been paid in full. For all produce and other stakes where a forfeit is payable no declaration is necessary. The non-payment of the remainder of the entry money at the time fixed for that purpose is to be considered a declaration of forfeit. The secretary is to be responsible for the entrance money of all dogs whose names appear upon the card. 31. Defaulters No one shall be allowed to enter or run a greyhound in his own or any other person's name who is a defaulter for either stakes, bets, dues, or fines. 32. Judge or slipper interested if a judge or slipper be in any way interested in a greyhound running, the steward shall appoint others to judge or slip any course which that greyhound may run. 
End of section 7